Okay, thank you, Susan. Reminded how worthwhile it is to do that. It just is, it is worthwhile. And I'm glad we didn't put that totally, together, totally on hold during this uh, COVID season. And um, it's great to hear the difference that uh, missions makes and to know we're involved in the work of God beyond here and under our uh, knows us, so to speak, and we're around the world. And that's what a good church does. Well, we're, we're yet to settle into another series. We've just kind of kept this open through all of this. I would, I might add that uh, Riley Fitchy was supposed to speak on the 18th of March. I had him queued up. And that was when all of this stuff came down, the 15th. And rather than put him in all of that, we just said, we'll get back to you. And I've Trying to get a hold of the uh, Riley Fitzhugh Evangelistic Association. It's, it's hard to book him. He's, he's already booked up. But uh, I'm t working at getting him before us, not on a Wednesday night, but a Sunday night, uh, whenever we can. So I just wanted you to know we have not forgotten Riley. And it would be great finally to hear him <laughs> in, a, in a good situation. Well, it's interesting that Sister Susan... Um, mentioned that last report about uh, looking for the coming of Christ. And so that's exactly what I want to talk about tonight, leaving in light of the second coming of Christ. And our text is, I've just got various scriptures. It's just one of those uh, times when I'm not just sitting in a particular place. It is the sad reality uh, of the long-term effects of a fast-paced society. I mean, if you think about it, uh, even the news we get is just so capsuled and they, they cherry pick things and they give you what they want you to hear. I mean, I hope you all know that. Fast paced, media based society. Uh, I, now we've grown to prefer sound bites over substance. And um, that can lead us, that just leads, and uh, yeah, even tonight before I came here. <laughs> A lot of confusion and a rush to judgment. It's just crazy. Yeah, you know, we want everything. We got to go at now, and, and and even in the name of justice to undo justice. I I don't understand that. This this is not to say or to minimize the value and the power of capsule thought. It's powerful, 
uh, especially in the form of quotes. Uh, and there are quotes of people that are certainly good to remember, and we should remember. Uh, we should remember William Carey when he said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. I mean, that, goodness gracious, reading that is just so powerful. Or Horace Greeley when he says, it is impossible to mentally or socially enslave a Bible reading people. Why is it that China, when it's all of its vast numbers, and is so afraid of the Bible? They're so afraid of Christianity. Isn't that amazing? There must be something there. What do you think? Yeah, they know. Anne Frank, and I, she says, how wonderful it is that nobody needs to wait a single minute before starting to improve the world. Right where you are, we can always do something to make it better. And so everything that Jesus said is quotable, don't you think? <laughs> the words of Jesus. Uh, and what did Peter say? Where can we go? You know, you have the words of eternal life. Everything, you, you speak life to us. And Jesus said those immortal words to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Wow. That, that was just uh, renovating. I mean, everyone is in need of that second spiritual birth. What it really says by that is our, our physical birth doesn't connect us with God. It doesn't give us entrance into the kingdom of God. It does not. And we'll be talking about this um, in chapter 3 of uh, 1 John Sunday night. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't make us the children of God to be born physically. We must be born of the Spirit, born of God, born again, which actually means to be born from above. And then Jesus said to Peter, I'll make you fishers of men. And so, sure, and Paul says in Romans 7 that it, we, it is predetermined that we should be conformed to the image of Christ. And that's the primary thing that God is doing in us through His Holy Spirit, who is the agent of change. And yet... Uh, Coupled with that is to um, love people to faith in Jesus Christ. We, we, must be, we, we must love and lead people to faith. And, and uh, it would be later that Peter would say in his letter, the long-suffering of the Lord is, lo is salvation. So why, why hasn't the Lord come again? We're going to talk about that tonight. Well, Peter says one of the reasons is he's, he's not willing that any should perish, right? So you can hear that fisher of men as a mature. Jesus said to his disciples, I'll not leave you comfortless, I'll come to you. Isn't that a great thing? I mean, how wonderful to know that as believers that, that the Holy Spirit comes to abide within us forever. And we're never alone. We're never alone. Uh, you know, he's as close as the mention of his name, the abiding spirit. Then Jesus said to his disciples again, in the same context, I'll come again and I'll receive you into myself. Right? That where I am, there, there, you may be also. And, and those are certainly a wonderful word. Jesus is coming again. And our hope, now, and we're so reminded of this, and we're so thankful of this. Our hope is not in this world system. It's not in a political party. It's not in an American president. It's not in, a, in, in America with its democracy and federalism and, and capitalistic system. It's not a republic. It, it, our hope is in the soon return of Jesus Christ. And that is the blessed hope, isn't it? And uh, we can't put our hope in anything that we can see, feel, or touch. You, you're setting yourself up for disappointment for a major letdown. And as we look around our world, we realize that uh, really I think the world is, the stage is set for the return of Jesus Christ. This world system is falling apart. Our beloved nation, America, is falling apart, coming apart before our eyes, degenerating, rotting from within. It was uh, Thomas Malcolm uh, Muggeridge uh, an English journalist. Uh, his father was a prominent socialist politician. 
and he was part of the early Labor Party in, in, in Parliament. This is how he was raised. And in his 20s, Malcolm uh, Muckleridge uh, was atta- attracted to communism, and he actually went and experienced it. He went and lived within the Soviet Union during the 1930s, and he returned back to Britain and became a forceful voice in opposition to communism. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? During the Second World War, he worked for the British government as a soldier and a spy, first in Africa for two years and then in Paris, France. And in the aftermath of the war, uh, Malcolm Muckeridge became an influential uh, journalist in London and in, in, in that had a friendship with another prominent British writer and journalist named Hugh Kingsmill, who happened to be a believer and Malcolm converted to Christianity. And so as a prolific writer and a Christian spokesman, Muckeridge began to study civilizations and the collapse of uh, nations and civilizations and the symptoms and the sign, the signs of a collapsing civilization. And so he, he came up with five signs of a collapsing civilization. One is the breakdown of law, law and order. You really, if you can't maintain law and order, you can't maintain anything. In the rise, uh, in the second, the rise in widespread morality and fascination with sexual themes. Third, excessive need for excitement. You know, that's kind of a, a media saturated world. You know, I mean, something's always you, you know. Some say that uh, what I'm doing now is just, you know, and, and if you're going to preach, you've got to keep it to about 15 minutes, you know. And I could capitulate with that. A lot of people do, but what good does that do? I don't know. Not in my watch. Fourth, the, the enormously complicated structure of government taxation and administration. Government with its taxation and regulations, they, they just mount and mount to a point that we collapse under the weight. And then fifth, excessive and pervasive boredom accompanied by a sense of emptiness and meaninglessness. And uh, Muckridge goes on to say many times that's the price of materialism. And it's empty, isn't it? Being told with this you can be happy. The Bible predicts such a collapse, really it does. And when we look into eschatology, uh, we know that this world, this present world system, by the way, has never been so interlocked in the history of humanity. Our markets, so, so many things, have so been interlocked. And there, we're, we're in a, a movement, and I understand it too. I understand it when it comes to the use of water. There are now really national concerns are being overshadowed by global concerns, and they're legitimate. They are. And, and so you can see even it drawing that way. And the stage, stage is being set for a well-polished, well-educated, charismatic leader to appear on the world stage with real solution to world problems. And the final world dictator is coming. And he's one who imposes... Uh, and exalt himself above all that is worshipped and his ultimate go. Uh, Paul says is actually set in God's temple and, and uh, proclaim that he is God. So in response to the reality of the soon coming of Jesus Christ, I, I think we just need to pause and examine our lives. No one knows just when Jesus will return in the clouds to catch out his bride. Uh, meanwhile, we must live each day as if it would be our last. Someone says that we're not in the rapture date setting committee. We're on the rapture preparation committee, right? We must live each day. And, and, and how, well, how do we do that? How do we live? And that's what this is about. How do we live in light of what I believe, you know, the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, he promised he was coming the first time in his first coming, and he came just exactly the way he said he would. And he'll come the second time in just the same manner. So I I got to thinking about four biblical commandments to obey until Jesus returns. 
and they're, they're really laid out in Scripture. So I'm going to arrange those for us, and uh, we'll talk through those and, and for the rest of the message. So in light of the second coming of Jesus, first we must occupy, okay? We must occupy. So we go to Roman uh, Luke chapter 19 for this. And Jesus is, was walking toward Jerusalem with his disciples. And they were talking about what we're talking about tonight, uh, the soon coming of the kingdom of God. And it was then that Jesus spoke his parable. He spoke about a nobleman who left his country and he traveled to a distant uh, country to receive a kingdom. And, and a kingdom was not so much a region or realm to rule. It was basically the authority or the right to rule. And upon leaving, the nobleman called his ten servants together. And we know he gave them each uh, ten, ten pounds and issued a departing command to them. And that's in verse 13 of Luke chapter 19. I'm just trying to capsule this for you. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said to them, what? Occupy till they come. Occupy. The word occupy means to do business. And, and do business. You know what? I'm so excited about Sunday. It's great to be back in business. You know what I mean? It's not that we weren't doing anything before. It's just, you know, with our church, get things up and running. And, uh, and, and in his absence, they were to carry on the work with the resources he had left them. Well, in time, the nobleman returned, and uh, he demanded of his ten servants, ten servants in accounting, how did they invest their resources? First servant traded, and using his master's investment, doubled it, doubled the investment. The second one invested his master's money and earned half as much as the third didn't invest it at all. Uh, he played it safe, right? And he, rather, he placed his, placed his monies away in a handkerchief and, you know, nothing was lost, okay, but nothing was gained. And, and the first two servants earned their master's praise and his reward at his coming and his return. The third servant was rebuked and he suffered loss. And so the picture here is very plain that Jesus in this parable, without really making it walk on all fours, uh, he's painting a picture and very clear. He is the noble one, and, and, and we are his servants. And, and Jesus has given us all we need. I believe that to accomplish. You know, he doesn't require of us what we don't have. He requires of us of what we have. He's given us all we need. Amen to accomplish his will and, and, and he traveled to has left and traveled to his father's house and then he's promised to return right and uh, at which time we're going to give an account you know all of us are set for the judgment in a sense there's just two right judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment judgment seat of Christ it means that uh, you know we're saved by grace but we're going to give an account for our lives here. And you say, well, it doesn't matter to me. Well, it will then. I, I believe that. And meanwhile, Jesus has left us with this challenge. Occupy. Right? Get busy till I come. Right? Make the most of what you have. Use it. You know, on airplanes, we just we took that trip to Israel this last, that seemed like a, 10 years ago. They, those bathrooms in an airplane, they have those special locked doors. You know, you slide that little bar to the right, and a, you know, a sign appears on the outside that says, Occupied. And it means that someone is doing business in there. <laughs> so wait, right? And if you're on a long, well, you know, you're on those air buses, you know, you're, you're, you're stretching your legs, getting the blood flow going. Jesus has left us with business to do. We're to, we're to, you know what, tonight, and, you know, we are doing kingdom business. We've been given authority to do kingdom business. And, you know, I remember Jesus as a 12-year-old boy there in Luke chapter 2, and he was entering an adult world, and he was becoming more aware and conscious of his father's business, his father's purpose for his life. And remember, he told Mary, he said, how, how, why is it you sought me? 
don't you desire for that I be about my father's business, okay? That's what occupy means, business. The things pertaining to my father, my purpose, already we can seem aware that Jesus was born with a divine earthly mission. And as a human being living under the constraints of time, and you don't think about that, but when he became a man, when he became flesh, he took upon a lot of the limitations, you know, and Jesus said, actually, it's going to be good when I go because I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. Right now, if I'm, you know, if, if, I'm, in per, uh, uh, if I'm Perea and Lazarus dies, I can't be in Perea and at the home in Bethany at the same time. You know, Martha says, well, where were you? You know, don't you care? He, he couldn't be both places. He said, but when I'm gone, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to come. He'll be with you everywhere all time. You know, it's better, he said. That was hard for them to really, really understand. But Jesus, on his earthly ministry, was under the constraints of time. And even as a 12-year-old kid, he was... And what an indictment many times against our present society when kids aren't moving forward. You know, and we should, we should parent and we should church our young people to... You know, as, as Paul says, there was a time when I became a man or a woman, a put away childish things. And so Jesus was, even at 12, was mindful of his adult purpose. Come on. Yeah. Uh, you remember we just recently were there in John chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, when he healed the man born blind. He said this, I must work the works of him that sent me. Here's the, okay. Occupy till I come. What is the day? Why? Not cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in this world. Now think about that. You're not going to be here forever. Neither am I. And, and, and it may not be five years from now. It may be five minutes from now. Five hours from now. I don't know. But we can only live in the eternal now with God, right? The now. I think it's so interesting that he says, as long I am the light of the world. As long as I'm here. What a wonderful example. Jesus says for all of us. Uh, Jesus made the most of his time. He made the most of his resources as he walked as the Son of God. And, and, and he kept his appointment. And, and I remember there in the 17th chapter of John, and we'll get there one day, maybe, who knows. <laughs> in the 17th chapter, right there at that great intercessory prayer, and uh, he says, I've glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work. Now think about this. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He was 33 and a half years old when he passed away. He had a lot to do. His ministry was three and a half years. But you know what? Got her done. Because he kept occupied, knowing that his time here, and this is our, this is our Savior. What, what did God, we could say that at the end of our lives? You know, I have finished the work that you have given me to do. What, what are we... Let me ask you tonight, what are you really good at? Is it painting? Is it counseling? Is it repairing things? Is it cooking, baking, singing? If it's baking, you can make cupcakes for the graduates. And not that that would ever happen, but it's just hypothetical. Is it singing? Is it playing an instrument? Is it teaching? Is it just encouraging others? Praise God. Oh, and a gift of mercy? There's always one or two people in a church that have the gift, they just ooze with it. Others, not so much. But they ooze with mercy. Joyce Walker, we miss her cards. It just takes one person to make a huge, you know, well, you don't have to wait to start changing the world, making the world a better place. Come on. Whatever it is that God has given you to do, He's gifted you to do. And perhaps you're good at finding opportunities to help people wherever you go, whatever your talent, whatever your skill. God has given it to you, just like this nobleman, to invest, knowing that he'll be coming again. And God doesn't bless us with talents and skills just so we can get noticed or employ them in worldly pursuits. To me as a pastor, one of the greatest things, and I am a facilitator, and if you've been around when I, as long as I've been around, when, when, when someone is, says, God has led me to do this, or I've got this gift, I would like to use it for the, whether we had martial arts here for a while. I, I said, go to it. You know? 
You know, use those for God's glory. Do martial arts here. And that was a wonderful ministry while it lasted. But, you know, uh, to me, that's what a church body is about. I mean, we could have to select for a praise team up here and do all your singing for you, but we got a choir up here. Oh, it would be great to have them back Sunday. But if you've got a gift, you know, use it. And, and, and use it for the Lord while you can. Because one day we're going to hear that. Welcome home, my good, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful to a few things, you know. God will make you rule over many. Come on. So in light of his coming, we're not just be, you know, in the air and, you know, all the, and, and you know, doing calculations, you know, and spelling words in the Bible backwards to get a code. Just get busy. Get busy. You know, and, and you say, well, I, I, sometimes I fear doing. You ought to fear not doing. Sometimes I fear giving. You ought to fear not giving. You know, we ought to, right? What do you do, do for do your very best? Come on. So here's the first thing. We must occupy in light of Jesus' return. Here's the second thing. We must purify. In a book written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship, there's a, there's a chapter, it's a great book called Cheap Grace. And in that chapter, Dietrich writes, Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living incarnate. In other words, don't waste the grace of God bestowed upon you. Don't waste it. Uh, and then he says, he went on to say, costly grace. Look at this quote, Cost, costly grace. It's costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner, you see. And so we're not to abuse the grace of God. And, and, and the New Testament talks about people who abuse the grace of God. They say, well, thank you, God, you know, and it's all by grace, so that means we don't, we're already saved and he's going to forgive us of our sins. And they say, what difference does it make? I mean, you're no different than the Greeks. I want you to know that G Paul says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Your bodies holy and acceptable unto God. And, and the, he gave these bodies significance. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It makes a difference what you do with your body, saved or lost. Come on. And you know, you're not to use your body for fornication. How plain can he make it? You know? You to use your body for glory. You know, and then he says there in the sixth chapter, you can use the, your members or your, your, of your body for sin or you can use them for righteousness, you see. And, and how sad to abuse the grace of God to justify selfish pursuits and to justify or gratify our desires. That may work down here, but when, you, when the nobleman gets back, it won't, it won't flow. And while well, well, Paul assures us in Romans 5.12, where sin abounds, grace does much more, more abound. So in, when he trips over into chapter 6, he asks the preposterous question, so do we go sin that God's grace may abound? Woo! Ah, I like that. I'll just go sin so God's grace can abound. You know, and he said, no. <laughs> of course not. For God forbid. God forbid. Paul tells us in Titus chapter 2, Verses 12 through 14, that the same grace that brings salvation, the same grace teaches us what? Denying ungodliness and worldly desires that we should live soberly, seriously, righteously. And, you know, by the way, soberly, then we go around, you know, mm, I remember when I first pastored, was, was practicing my preaching. And one, one man in the church indicted me for for telling jokes behind the sacred desk. Well, it didn't work. I, you know, I continued to show a little humor behind the sacred desk. But it didn't mean, you know, it's like, you know, we always live around like we got gas or something, you know, just, see, I haven't stopped. Righteously, godly, in this present world, looking for that what? Talk to me. Blessed hope. The, what is that? The glorious appearing of our great God and Lord, our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Why? To redeem us, to buy us back from all iniquity, and purify. There we go. Purify unto himself a, 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 a people of God's own possession, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Wow. So there's the... There's the uh, including this purification to purify our lives, is occupy as well. Zealous unto 
good works. We're not saved by works, but we're saved unto, right? That word purify is uh, catharizo. You know, I'm thinking we catharize things in the medical world. We catharize, cauther, cauther, I'm saying the wrong catharize. You know what, cauterize. We cauterize things, we sear them off, you know. And, and we, uh, boy, I tell you what, I don't know if alcohol, just rubbing alcohol in an open sore does that or not, but it sure feels like it. It, it feels better after it stops hurting. <laughs> but it means to cleanse. And for the, for the last several months, we've been lectured and been cautioned about to purify our hands and purify our lives. Why? Well, you know, because we learned that a little personal hand, you know, a diligence, and it doesn't take a lot just doing this. If that's all we did, it would be, you know, the whole influenza thing would help. Colds. You know, this means I never wash some hand. I never wash my hands so much. Have you? And it's now it's just imprinted. Imprinted. I'm going to tell this joke. It wasn't a joke. It happened today. Russ and Cheryl were back here in the office, and Grayson was there. And you know, so I got engaged in him, and whoa. But uh, Cheryl's got this huge this flower. It's about like a I don't know what kind of flower it is, but like a sunflower. It's not a sunflower, but anyway, you don't have the the, the hard that. Well, it's all blown up. And it's real magnified on her screen, big screen. And so there's he. And Grayson looked across her office and pointed and says, there's a COVID virus right there. <laughs> no, it's not. But it looked like it. He got it. You understand? Purify. So you know why? We're avoiding a deadly disease. Well, guess what? Sin is a deadly disease. In the late 6th century, uh, Pope Gregory I is known for identifying the seven deadly sins. They're kind of categories, pride, envy, wrath, jealousy, gluttony, lust, sloth, and greed. You know, Proverbs has its own list of sins, right, that God hates. Truth be known, all sin is deadly, right? And so as Christians, we've been given the great responsibility to be self-purging, self-cleansing vessels. we got Self-defrosting freezers, right? Self-cleaning ovens. You know, we, we sh we're given that responsibility to purify our own lives. 2 Timothy 2 says, It echoes this truth of a man, therefore purge himself of these. He shall be a vessel of honor, sanctification, meet for the master's use, prepared for every good work. The reality of Christ's soon coming should... So, see, for every doctrine in the Bible, there's a practical import. Okay, And when it comes to eschatology, and this is the second coming of Christ, the takeaway should be to purify our lives. What, what would you do tomorrow? You know, what changes would you make in your life if you knew Christ was coming? If I have an altar call tonight and we knew that Jesus was coming back tonight, would it be full? Would we think differently about our lives? And really that's the point. That's the point, is that, um, you know, it's interesting, and, and I'm going to be in, man, we're already having a live light mic tonight. Monday night, I'm gonna, uh, Sunday night, I'm going to be in 1 John uh, 3, but he talks about the appearing of Christ and being glorified in his presence. We shall be with him, we shall see him as he is, and we shall be what? And then the next verse, he says, and every man that hath this hope, what? Talk to me. Purifies himself. Even as he is pure. So we're talking about in light of the second coming. We have the nobleman coming back to give us to give an account. Jesus says, that's me, servant, that's you. And you have to give an account. Get busy and stay busy. Come on. And then the second in relationship to the coming you need to purify your lives. I mean, the grace of God working in our lives produces lives that are holy, pure, and a pure, holy life is one that shines the love and the light of Jesus to everyone in its reach. A pure and a holy life is one that is without blame, refusing to excuse, uh, live, uh, give excuse to anyone who would look for a reason not to believe in Jesus Christ. I mean... We should live lives that aren't stumbling blocks to the lost. We are, our lives should make people thirsty 
for Christ. Here's the third thing. We must watch. And here's the third admonition. It's so clear in Mark chapter 13, verses 31 through 33. Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away. My word shall not pass away. But of that day, the hour no man knows, uh, not even the angels or in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take heed, notice, watch and pray. For you know not when the time is. Verse 37 of the same chapter he says, I say unto you again, watch. And so that word watch means to stay on the alert, to be on guard. And there's a great gap between the world of a parent and the world of a teen, you know. And the difference is the wisdom gained by experience. A teenager or a kid, you know, they don't see any consequences of doing anything. They can't, they can't see that far ahead. You can't see the... Uh, the, the, the danger lurking in the shadows. And so that's what parents uh, have learned through life. Uh, and so parents spend a lifetime telling kids to watch out, you know? Watch out. And in a real way, we as believers are to watch, be aware of the coming of the Lord Jesus. We may pay attention. And we heard it in a mission report tonight. Pay attention to the headlines, the current events, the trends in our changing culture. However, we don't watch with, we, we're not to watch, that doesn't Im, imply doing this. We're, we're not to watch in horror, but in hope. We're not to watch in fear, but in faith. And Luke said, uh, Jesus said in Luke 21, uh, 28, and when these things began to pass, what? Look up, because you're Redemption draws nigh. Lift your heads. Lift your heads. And as bad as it is, praise God, it's going to get, it's be wonderful one day. Hey, Amen. We're pilgrims. When it, when it talks about this world as God's people, we're passing through. And we're not to lay up treasures here. Come on. So we, we are to occupy. We're to stay busy. We're to keep our lives pure before him and blameless and then we are to watch and anticipate and here's the fourth thing we are to worship first corinthians eleven twenty six. after offering instruction on the observance of the lord's table and we're going to lord willing we're going to do that we're going to have we're working toward an easter in june if you can have christmas in july you can have easter in june and the and, and we were we were set to have a special music on Easter and do the Lord's table and that didn't happen. And so you said, well, why, 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 are, why are we pushing to have the choir and get everybody back? Because we need to occupy. And, and we're, we, can't, we, can't, um, we can't do business as God called us, you know, when we're scattered all over. And so, and we're, we're working for this time when we observe the table. And by the way, it, just do this in remembrance of me but it's also forward-looking, isn't it? Notice what Paul says if he gives instruction to the Corinthian church in verse 26. For often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you show the Lord's death, what? Till he come. And in verse, Luke 11, verse 8b, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith. So whether we're worshiping by celebrating the Lord's table as a church, Lord willing, or spending every Time every day in prayer, watch and pray, or time in God's Word. Oh, I'm in Ezra now, and I've been, I was reading Ezra today, and how those wonderful people were discouraged and threatened going back and doing what they did, but they still did it. They built that temple. They offered those sacrifices. They didn't let it get in the way. And I made a note in the side of my Bible. I said, oh, God, help us. In the face of opposition, just to be strengthened in our will to do the right thing. Come on. To be a people of faith. And I thought, you did, we can. You did it in the face of danger and death. And God help us to not be soft. Living a life of faith before the world. Sharing our faith. Attending church. Demonstrating God's love to our family. Serving in our church. All of it cultivates and feeds our faith, you see. And, and that the things that of this world cultivate and feed our fears and our flesh. But, but, you know, we need to cultivate our faith. We need to starve our fears. Amen? And we need to feed our faith. 
tell you what, if you sit and watch the television or the media or whatever, and you listen to what's going on out there, it's not good. I mean, after a while, I, I said, oh. In these last days, we'd best not neglect our worship. It's no wonder that we're exhorted in Hebrews 11, 23. Let, let's hold fast our faith, the profession of our faith without wavering. For it's faithful that promise. Let us consider one another, provoke one another to love and good works. And, and you know, if you have to wear a mask, wear a mask, you know. <laughs> consider one another, not forsaking the assembling of yourself together. As the manner of some is, and exhorting one another, encouraging one another, and what? So much the more. As you see the day approaching. And you know, that phrase, the day, it's eschatology. Talking about the end of time. The great and dreadful day of the Lord. The things we see taking place in our nation shouldn't discourage us. It shouldn't defeat us or lessen our determination to follow Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, the chaos, confusion, danger, and destruction all around us should cause us to focus on the blessed hope of Jesus' return. And we must say along with John, the apostle, he said at the end, he was exhausted, no doubt. Even so, come. Even so, come. Lord Jesus. So what are you doing in light of his coming? We must remember these four things. One, occupy ourselves by making the most of our time and talents to advance the kingdom of God. You may not be able to tomorrow to do tomorrow what you can do today. Did you get that? Second, purify Cleanse ourselves of every sin and vice that would trip us up, weight us down in our daily pursuit of Christ. You know, I'm drawn right there to those wonderful verses at the top end of chapter 12 in Hebrews, laying aside the weight and the sin that does so easily weight us down and trip us up. Third, watch by being spiritually aware and alert to the evidence around us that point to Jesus' coming. And then fourth, worship the Lord Jesus Christ involving, involving ourselves in spiritual d disciplines such as prayer, Bible reading, giving, witnessing church, attending church, making a difference in our community. You know, don't neglect the spiritual aspect of our lives. And it's so easy to. Satan, with all of these distractions, oh, and there are distractions. But you've got to get back to what Paul says. You know, this one thing I do. And there's times, you know, I get so busy. I said, I'm going to put my Bible reading off to later in the day. Not really me. I'm just speaking hypothetically. <laughs> and then there's times, you know, I can. I said, you know, I don't care what tomorrow. You know, I know I got all this stuff stacked up. It, I, I'm going to. I'm going to get back to God's word. And, in the morning before it gets so crazy and focus, focus, focus and it always is rewarding now we don't know what's going to happen during the day but God does and I don't care if we're in Ezra or Nehemiah I, I don't care if we're in Leviticus God will use something to prepare us for what's ahead Someone said it's during our darkest moments that we must focus, focus to see the light. How's your faith? We always say, how you doing? How you, you know, oh, you know, this or that. or How you doing in your heart and your soul, you know? How you doing? How's your walk with God? God, help us to pray for each other. Amen. And encourage each other, provoke each other to love and good works. Because Jesus is coming again. Yeah. Father in heaven, as we have taken time through your word to claim this wonderful reality, 
this wonderful promise that you are. And, and he will face you, Lord, in death. will face you one day that you'll return. One way or the other. Father, help us to make the most of every opportunity, of, of every day and every hour. Knowing, dear God, that while we're in the world, we have this time because not coming. Well, it's day. Oh, God, help us not to be discouraged, not to be lazy, but to be proactive and, 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 and intentional in our living for you. And God, help us have a burden for others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand together.